When you think of uh, games and how Hollywood has influenced our culture, and we were playing Hollywood Game Day and Hollywood Game Night, and I was trying to think about how we could tie that in to a challenge. So we're talking about the influence that Hollywood has made upon our culture. Now, I'm not going to be one to say that I don't go to movies because I go to movies. I enjoy movies. There's times where I go to movies where I cringe at those movies. Can somebody give me an amen. You say things or you hear things or you see things that you know are a direct opposition of what God's word has for you to say. What do you do in those times? What do you do when you know you're doing something, watching something, or experiencing something that you know is in opposition of God's Word? The Bible says in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, it says, Do not love the world or the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. You know, our culture is greatly influenced by the things that we see and the things that we watch. It has been greatly influenced, and I firmly believe that sometimes that influence has desensitized us to a point that we enjoy things that God does not want us to enjoy. To a point that we think it's okay, or we think it's all right. Our children try to emulate the very things that we sometimes would not want them to emulate. Sometimes they dress the thing way that they are watching to be popular. Sometimes there's all kinds of issues that our kids are going through that we are emulating a culture that is so foreign to what we would think of in Wichita, Kansas. But the image, the ability to be a movie star, the ability to be um, liked is overwhelming. We as a society have become so desensitized to movies we watch, the sex, the language, the blow-up scenes, we have accepted it as normal. Many of us also have poor body images due to the things that we see through the movie stars that we watch. We would think that they have it all together. We would think that they are very happy. But in most cases, the movie star industry has very low self-esteem and has a very high divorce rate. Because marriage on prideful people is devastating. Marriage when it is all about you instead of about us is devastating. There are some lies that are coming across the Hollywood scene. Now when I say Hollywood, I'm not talking about Los Angeles. I'm talking about the philosophy, the influence that the cinema industry has put upon our culture compared to what the biblical mandate is that God has given to us, can we see the difference and what do we do about that difference? I'm not going to ask you to change your life. I'm not going to ask you to, to ban going to movies or to ban watching uh, TV shows. But what we must do is we must see the difference and we must stand up for the difference. At least be aware that that culture, that influence is contrary to sometimes what God has for us to believe in. Here's one of the lies. It's only entertainment it doesn't really influence people. It's just entertainment. It really doesn't influence anybody. And when we think that Hollywood is just entertainment, it's just mindless entertainment that we sit in front of our TV, our 82-inch TV, sitting on our couch watching TV, we go mindless for three hours. Is it just a TV show or does it influence? You know, we would say sometimes with our kids that, you know, you shouldn't be watching that. And why, they say, why, why, why? Well, it's not appropriate for you. And if we say the same thing to a 12-year-old man, it should be the same thing to a 52-year-old man. If something is not appropriate, guess what? Something is not appropriate. And so when we look at what we as parents say to our kids, we have to say the same thing as our father is saying to us. And sometimes the industrial lie says it's only entertainment. It doesn't influence anyone. And the second thing, we just reflect reality. Don't blame us, blame society. Hollywood is just trying to put entertainment out there that people will flock to the entertainment industry too. It, it really is just a reflection of reality. And all they are trying to do is build movies to attract individuals. 
It's a reflection of reality. Sociologist James Wilson has pointed out a curious fact. He says this, On the cities where broken windows have gone unrepaired, the crime rate immediately soars. Why? The broken windows make an announcement to the public. Here, standards have been broken down. Here, no authority applies. Come and do what you like with consequences today. Uh, without consequences. Today, television and movies have become a gigantic broken window to the world. It portrayal of life without standards and misbehavior without consequences sends a message and chaos reigns. For the moment, our residual common interest and sensitivity to traditions are resting. But now, how long can we hold out if these broken windows in our society are not boarded up and shut up? What happens is what we have is our kids are watching what we do. And our broken windows of our lives and we have no watch over them, and we do not care. And what we enjoy, they will enjoy. What we entertain, they will entertain. Broken windows. In our culture, we see riots, and we see all kinds of things, and cities devastated, and people coming alongside. And now it's just a, a, a mass of individuals with no consequences. In Hollywood, some of the movies that are coming out, we look at, and they are direct opposition of what God would call a Christian to look at and to be part of. Sometimes you're watching a movie and some of the trailers come on and you're like, tell me if you haven't said this, wow, they are running out of ideas. How in the world did somebody even think that up? How depraved sometimes are we just to think that that is entertainment. Somebody spent millions of dollars to invest in a movie that you're looking at that and say, 60% of the Christian culture should never even think about going to that. But yet you throw a movie in that's a Christian base. And the first weekend, it's really good. But all the Christians go in one weekend, the second or third weekend, it's done, signed, sealed, and delivered out because there's no influence of the positive. Here's the lie number three. We give the public what it wants. If people don't like it, they can always just turn it off. They can make... They can influence any way that they want. And then they say, I'm going to do what I want. It's your responsibility. It's your moral conduct. It's your moral code. If you do not like it, your responsibility is to turn it off. Now, if we had little kids, eight to nine-year-old kids, and they were watching something that you think was not appropriate, would you say, hey, when you think that's too bad, turn it off? If you, if you think they're going to do something that you don't want to watch or you shouldn't watch, just turn it off. Now, I have a couple boys that were growing up, and guess what? Their eyes would be glued to that TV until I came in and I turned it off. That's the moral compass that we have to have. It is not their job to make sure that we do or do not do our job. Our job is to make sure that we hold a higher standard, and our standard is one that honors God. So let's look at some misconceptions of what Hollywood has said and what they believe. Number one, that faith is not intellectual. Faith is not intellectual. And there are people in our world that believe this very same thing. The question is, they either do not believe that God exists and they call themselves atheist, or they believe that they don't know God exists and they call themselves agnostic. Either atheists or agnostics still believe that God cannot exist or they do not have enough truth that he believes that he exists. So there was a simple story found back in the Quaker days that says this. One such individual supposedly confronted an old Quaker and taunted him. Have you ever seen God? Have you ever felt God? Have you ever smelled God? And have you, have you ever, and, and he say, have you, I goofed that up. Have, and you say you have a God. In other words, there is no evidence and there is no proof. Well, the Quaker replied, has you ever seen thy brains? Have you ever felt thy brains? Have you ever smelled thy brains? And then he paused. Ah, thou sayest you have no brains. <laughs> because sometimes you have to know what you believe. But Psalm chapter 51, 53 verse 1, David declares, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. The fool has said in their heart, there is no God. Now, who do you pray to? When you're down and you're out, and you're hurting. One of the most sweetest times that you have is when you have communion with God. It takes faith 
to believe in the existence of God. It is a fool that says, I can do this on my own. I don't need God. God does not exist, is what they are saying. But I would tell them that when you are out and when you need a presence and a peace of God, you don't pray to an individual and you don't pray to an idol. When their marriage is falling apart and your problems exist and people are dying, you get on your knees and you face God. And when you have a holy God that's on your side and when you need something, God comes alongside you and he comes beside you and loves you. And then they say God is not the creator. God is not the creator. God did not create what we have here. This is by happenstance. But in Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that light was good, and God divided the light into darkness. God called it light day, and he called the darkness night. So the evening and the morning were that first day. I liked what it said, God created. When we have faith in God, and we know the word of God to be true, we have to understand every, every part of God's word is true. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, by faith we understand that the world was framed by the word of God so that the things which we are seeing are not made of things which are visible, but that are invisible. God spoke the world into existence Sure, can we prove that? Were we there to see that? No, but we watch the framework of God every morning. I see some of your pictures that you say, look at this beautiful sunset. You go on travels, you, you go to the ocean and you see a beautiful sunset. And you look at that. Only God could create the framework of the morning sunset or the evening dawn. It is a beautiful picture of what God has gone. You go to Colorado and you sit in the majesties of the mountains and you see the beautiful framework of the mountains and you see the running waters and you see what God has orchestrated for the beauty of this world. You could not look at that and say that just happened. God created out of his mouth. God created the heavens and the earth. We sit at school and we hear some lies and we believe these lies. And what we have to do is we have to teach our children the truth about God's word and have concrete evidence of God's word and believe it in our life so they can stand up and say, you know what, I do believe in the existence of God and this is why I believe in the existence of God. Not just because God said it, because I have experienced it. I have seen God's work, I've seen God's way and God has held me tight in my biggest need. And one of the last lies that they say on this point is uh, Jesus is not the only way. It becomes very popular now. It is very popular in our culture this week to say Jesus is a way. As long as we are sincere in our faith, as long as we get on our knees and we ask God to love us, it'll be okay. I have a personal story that, that uh, many of you that have been here a long time have heard this story, but um, I think it fits so important that... Uh, my brother was, was murdered a few years ago. And, uh, and I preached my brother's funeral. And my sister uh, picked me up and uh, we drove to Wamego to do the funeral. And my sister has two nieces. Or my sister has two daughters, which are my two nieces. And, uh, and I, I preached that funeral. And it was a time of decision in my life because I was the new preacher and, and my brother was there and he had all of his high school friends there and, and everybody was at this funeral. And I was the brother, I was the preacher. And, and uh, I, I just shared about Jesus. I just shared. And uh, on the way home, my sister and I were in the car by ourselves and she said, Bruce, do you believe all that word that you preached? at Gary's funeral. I said, yeah. She said, are you telling me that God would put my two daughters to hell if they don't believe in Jesus? They believe in God? We talk about God all the time. They're good kids. Are you saying that they would not go to heaven if they did not believe in your Jesus? And I said, Cheryl, I love you dearly. I love Aaron and Sharice dearly. But it's our job to say that there's only one way that we can go to heaven, and that is through Jesus Christ. 
She looked at me and she laughed. But then last, the, a month after that, um, she called me up and I was a youth pastor. And she said, uh, Bruce, can Sharice and Aaron, can they go to summer camp with your church? <laughs> Absolutely. So they drove down to Texas and they unloaded their stuff and they went to summer camp with us that very first night. One of my nieces came forward and gave her life to Christ. The second night, the second sister, her second niece, came down and gave her life to Christ. And I said, hey girls, will you do me a favor? Can you call my, my sister and kind of tell her what's going on here? Because you know what? It's not good enough to be good. It's not good enough to know that there's a God. It's not good enough to believe in a God. It's not good enough to go to church. The Bible says, Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It is not about Allah, and it's not necessarily about God. It's about Jesus through salvation. God is the creator, but Jesus is the redeemer. And if we believe in Jesus, we have been redeemed. But if they can take Jesus out of our culture, if they can make Jesus of no effect, the redemptive plan of God has been silenced by a society, by a culture that believes all you have to do is be good or all you have to be is be sincere. But God says, I sent my son to die for you. And I am the only way that you're going to get redeemed is by the blood of Jesus Christ. They can take it out, they can laugh at it, and they can mock it, but it doesn't change the fact that it is true. So when we preach Jesus, it's not about being good. It's not about being holy. It's about accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And any movie that takes Jesus out, takes the blood of Jesus Christ out, or any movie that mocks what Jesus Christ has done is contrary to the very word of God. So that goes to the next point. Sometimes they believe that God is love. And he is love only, so much love, that you can do whatever you want. Now God is love. But listen to this point so carefully. God loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But that word world is a word that talks about the people in the world. God loved people so much that he gave his only begotten son. Let's look, if you have your Bibles, this is so important. Let's look at 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. It's a lot of reading, but it's very important. Because if you say God is love, what is the opposite of love? It has to be anger, hatred, God is love, but the opposite is God has anger. Opposite is God has hatred. There are things that God loves, and there's things that God hates. And if we love God, the things that anger God should anger us. The things that God loves, we should love. And if we do not love the things of God, and if we do not detest the things that he hates, what we're doing is we're in a flowing river with no boundaries, and we have no idea what we're going to do. But 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 21, says this, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God was sent his only begotten son into this world that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we love God, but he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, so we also love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. By this we may by this we know that we are abiding in him and he is in us because he has given us his spirit and we have seen and testified that the father has sent the son and the savior of the world whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God God abides in him and he is in God and we have known and believed in love that God has for us God is love and he whoever abides in love abides in God and God in him Love has been perfected among us 
in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so we are in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been perfected in love. We love him because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he does not love his brother whom he has seen. How can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him that he who loves God must love brothers also. God loves people. God loves you. God has given to us the spirit of God to love the things of God. But let's look at the contrast of that. The opposite of that. Seven things that God hates and we should too. Let's look first at Proverbs chapter 6 verses 16 through 19. If, if God is love and God loves people, then the contrast of that is the things that God hates we ought to abstain from and we should not inject. There are six things that the Lord hates. Seven that are abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, a hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that divides wicked plans, feet that makes haste to run to do evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among the brothers. Let's look at that. We're looking at the influence of Hollywood. We're looking at the influence of our culture. We're looking at things that people lift up instead of things that people tear down. And the first thing that God says he hates is Pride. Pride. Arrogance. A proud look. Somebody that thinks that they are better than everybody else. Somebody that looks down on other individuals. And if we are a child of God, we should love others, lift others up, encourage others. Even if, even if they are in sin, our job is to love them through their sin. Even if they do not agree with us, our job is to love them through whatever they are doing. In response of haughty eyes, for God resisteth the proud and gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves there before the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Pride. Pride is one of the most detrimental things of our society. In the United States, pride is crippling. Sometimes we are so prideful in our position we will do everything within our power to hold on to our power instead of allowing other people to influence us. Our politics, our positions, what we must do is we must humble ourselves and say, what does God want for us? Not what's best financially for us, but what is best for us. What does God say we should have? A proud look and then a lying tongue. He said, these things I hate. I hate a lying tongue. Say what you believe. Say what you are. Tell the truth. Not telling the truth is just saying the wrong thing. Sometimes we use our culture and we do the, the politically correct statement and say, oh, I misspoke. No. You what? You lied. You lied. God hates pride and he hates a liar. Lying lips are abomination to the Lord, but they deal truly are his, but they who do true are his delight. He hates liars. Hands that shed innocent blood. Hands that shed innocent blood. He that follow after righteousness and mercy findeth righteousness and honor. But God says he hates those that shed innocent blood. Number four, a heart that devises wicked plans. Plotting revenge. Conspiring to deceive and to hurt other people. Whether it's a potsy scheme for finances or whether it's a plot to hurt or to kill somebody. A heart that is divisive. A heart that's trying to cause problems. Feet that make haste to do evil. These are things that God says he hates. Feet that make haste to run to evil things that you look forward to doing that are contrary to God's word. If you're looking forward and making plans to do things that God hates, we have a problem with God's love and God's hatred. What we're doing is we have been desensitized to what God truly wants for our life. A false witness who breathes out lies, falsely accusing someone of the misbehavior and not accepting that responsibility for themselves. 
In Proverbs chapter 3, it says, Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the tablet of thine heart, so you shall find favor and a good understanding in the sight of God and man. We need to tell the truth. We need to lift and encourage other people. But one thing that we cannot do is cannot let other people lie and let them by with it. We must stand for the truth of God's word. And the last thing that he says, he says six things he hates and the seven things is an abomination. One who sows discord among the brethren. <laughs> he goes into this and he said this is the last thing and this is one that he hates the most. Those that sow discord amongst the brethren. Loves, he loves the church. He loves the church so much he sent his son to die for the church. And one thing that he loves, he loves unity within the body of Christ and he hates discord among the church. He hates lies, and he hates rumors, and he hates church splits because it causes division within the body of Christ. And what we must do is we must hold on to one another, listening to gossip and repeating gossip, slandering and repeating truths that will harm other individuals, leading others to imagine the worst about something or about someone. I've used this illustration many times. But here's what God, here's what Satan does. In, in our worst case scenarios, whether it's in a church setting or whether it's at your job or whether it's in your marriage, he takes the worst day that you have. He takes the worst fight that you've ever been through. He looks at your checking account at the worst possible moment. He looks at your marriage at the worst possible day. And Satan takes a snapshot and puts that on your refrigerator and says, there it is. That's as good as it's going to get. And every morning, you get into that refrigerator and you look at that snapshot, you look at, that's what I get. And so long, we look at that and then we start believing that that's as good as it gets because it's a snapshot in time that's a very low point. But here's what God does. He said, get rid of that snapshot because I am here and I want to give you life and I want to give you life more abundantly and I'm not going to keep you at the low point. I'm going to bring you through the low point to the high point. We have to have faith in God and what we must do is we must look at a snapshot and say that is for me to pray to get out of, to make better but not to live in. I cannot believe the lies of Satan. What I must do is I must stand firm and hold on to the truth of God's word. There's a bigger picture than the snapshot. There's a bigger picture of one moment in time. So many people that have done stupid things within their own life have done things because of a snapshot. They think it can't get any better. They can't see tomorrow. They can't get through tonight. So they end their life and they end relationships because of a snapshot that Satan has put in their face and they believe that lie. What we must do is get rid of that. And believe in God and believe that God has given to us something greater than a moment of time. He gave to us a life that's greater than that. And that gives to our third point. They want you to think that the world and its philosophies can satisfy your every need. That the world and the philosophy can satisfy your need. Beautiful ladies dressed up in gowns. A handsome man driving a Lincoln Continental. They believe that if you look at this, you can glamorize and you can be just like them. You can look at them and say, wow, if I could emulate them, I could have all this. If I could lose 150 pounds and weigh 95 pounds, I can be perfect and people will love me. If I can get on a diet and if I can look good, I will have everything at my disposal. And you find out in Hollywood... Just because you look really good doesn't mean you're really happy. Just because you have a large bank account doesn't make you very happy. See, some of the most unsatisfied people in the world are the people that have almost everything. But having things does not equate to being happy. What equates to being happy is having Jesus. What equates to being happy is understanding where your happiness comes from. Because if our happiness is involved around our surroundings, if our happiness is because I have a good day, if my surroundings, I, ha I have a good paycheck, I have a good month, if I've lost five pounds, if that is my happiness, guess what? We are going to be miserable every day. 
But if I can look at my life and say my joy is foundational and it's in Jesus and my hope is in Christ and my future is secure, I do not have to worry about this world satisfying me because I know it is fickle. I know that it won't happen. It will not happen. They have glamorized the thought of more money will make us happy. People believe that now Hollywood has been taught that more things equal more money will make more people that will go to the movies that will like them so they can make more money. And you see that devastating. You see the depression. You see the people that we watch on movies commit suicide. You see the adultery. You see the depravity. What we have to do is we have to see the difference. We have to be the difference. We have to make sure that what we look at, that we understand, is this what God wants? But see, if we're not children of God, if we're not, not blood-bought saints of God, if we go to church because we have to go to church, if we don't know that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, and we don't know that, that my life has been changed radically because of what Christ has done for us, the this, this stuff of this world, it does make sense. It does entice. Because we've never been to the point of humility so we can accept the grace of God. But once we've been broken to the point that I understand what Jesus Christ has done for me, I understand my satisfaction is not on who I was and what I did. My satisfaction is where I went. I went on my knees before Christ. I have accepted him as my Lord and Savior. Now I understand where my satisfaction comes from. It's not satisfying to be in my sin. It's satisfying to be saved. It's satisfying to be redeemed. It's satisfying to know that I'm going to heaven. That's where I get my satisfaction. Now, after we know that, what do we do with our satisfaction? God has called the body of Christ to do something with it, not just to sit on it. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 9 through 11, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gifts you have to receive and serve others as faithful servants of God's grace in various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so with one who speaks with the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the very strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Our purpose is not to have all the money. Our purpose is not to have everything. Our purpose is to proclaim the message of the one that gave us what we have. And if we proclaim the message with hospitality, with sharing, with loving, with caring, in the name of Jesus Christ, that is where real joy takes place. Real joy as a believer to know that my job is to serve my Lord. Find ways to show hospitality to someone. Find ways to serve each other. Find ways to speak and encourage. Church is just a great place to learn about God. It's kind of like a miniature Bible college. But Jesus meant it to be more than that. He meant the church to be a laboratory where Christians should train each other in the ministry and train each other to do God's love. And if it is a laboratory, the, the specimen, the, the thing that makes us grow has to be the unity and the love of Jesus Christ. You shall know you're a disciple if you have love one for another. Hollywood would say, you would know you love if you have sex one with another. But sex and love are two totally different things. We have to train our kids and we have to believe in our life that true love, making love, giving love, is an institution of the heart and it gives out because of our action, because of our love one for another. There's a big difference between loving somebody and having somebody. And what we have to do is we have to desensitize. They, we cannot allow them to desensitize our thought of what true love truly is. Now, Matthew chapter 16 says this. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange of his soul? 
You know, when you think about what will you give? What will you exchange? What is the price tag? Jesus gave his life for you. And he's not asking us to do that. He's not asking us to lay our life down. He's asking us to give our life up. He's asking us to serve. He's asking us to do things that he, he can only do through us. Many people spend their lives enjoying the lives of the rich, but they don't realize the money and the world cannot truly satisfy. The true satisfaction in a Christian life is serving someone that cannot serve themselves. Doing for someone without them asking for them to be done. When you serve, when you love, and when you help, you're doing the contradiction of the Hollywood philosophy in this world. Their philosophy, bottom line, is to get. What's in it for me? The Christian, our philosophy must be, I want to give. I want to serve. I want to give my life. I want to do things for other people. Not to lift me up because God resisteth the proud. But to humble myself. So the gifts that I offer, the resources that I give, the help that I give, I give on my knees before God and say, God, use them. Use them whichever way you want. However you want me to be used. Whatever you want me to say. Whatever you want me to do. It's not about me. I am humbling myself before you. And you are giving me the satisfaction within my life. The joy that I need. The contentment that I need. And it's not about me. It's not about pride. It's not about what I can do and what I can't do. It's all about what God can do through me. We are a conduit for God's blessing. And whenever we think that it's us, it's all about me, it's all about what I have, look at me and look what I can do, that is pride. And God says he resisteth. He turns back. He repels the pride. You may be the best singer. You may be the best preacher. You may be the best teacher. You may be the best at something. But when we know that we're the best of something and we show everybody that we're the best of something, God resisteth that. But, in our humbled state, when we can say, Lord, use me. Lord, just let me say the right thing. Let me do the right thing. Let me give to the right cause. Let me love the right way. God says, out of your humility, I will give you peace, contentment, satisfaction. You will be able to close your eyes at night, not worrying about what you have, but you are thankful for what you did. And when you can do that, that's satisfaction. That is peace. That's what God wants within our lives.